Okay, so this is very detailed, um, <laughs> and I'm not going to go through it all. Um, I, I, that's kind of why we asked you to give introductions at the beginning, so we could see which parts of the world you're coming from. Um, turns out you're coming from most parts of the world. <laughs> um, so I'll just pick up a few, a few, uh, a few points here. Um, okay, first of all, let's look at Europe. We have some U European, European people here. So um, Europe kind of benefited from the overall rebound in FDI to developed economies. So FDI flows increased by massively, you know, um, by over a thousand percent, you know, in 2021. However, you know, greenfield um, FDI projects actually declined. Okay, it, in, in Europe as a whole, um, whereas international project finance deals went up. Um, if we look at which other regions do we have here? Um, Latin America, some gentleman from Brazil there. So in Brazil, um, FDI flows, or sorry, in Latin America, Brazil, FDI flows went up 75%. Uh, I was actually in Colombia two weeks ago, so they were doing quite well, I think, in attracting investment in the last year. Um, Greenfield FDI also went up 8%, and international project financing up by 63%. So the picture for Latin America is, you know, is fairly, fairly strong, actually, compared to some of the other regions there. Um, if we look at Africa, so a gentleman from Ni Ni Nigeria, um, FDI inflows went up greatly to over 200%. Um, Greenfield FDI, though, actually declined. Um, so that would be driven by a few M&A deals uh, behind uh, the increase in, in FDI flows. So there's quite a different picture you know, in different parts of the world. Okay, but when you're looking at FDI, I think this is a really nice way to present it. You want to really look at, okay, what's happening over FDI, which is the FDI flows, what's happening in M&A, what's happening in Greenfield FDI, and what's happening in international project financing. If you look at it across those four different metrics, you really get a good view of what's happening globally and in, in your particular region of the world or in your country. And they may tell different stories as well at any point in time, as we can see here. Okay. Um, Okay, looking at some of the destination market trends. Um, so we look at last year, you know, which countries were the biggest, most successful countries in attracting foreign direct investment. Uh, this is in, in, in billions of dollars. This is just looking at the greenfield capital investment. Um, you can see, as would we expect, the US was, you know, was number one in the world, um, followed by the UK, which may be a, a bit more surprising there, but there are some, some big projects in sectors like renewable energy and a few other sectors. Um, China, Spain, Malaysia, uh, Brazil, Japan, Mexico, Poland, Canada. So it's a real mix of the you know, G7 type economies followed by the big emerging markets. Um, and that's because you know, FDI is very strongly correlated to GDP. You know, uh, the bigger your economy, generally the more FDI you attract. There are lots of exceptions, small countries like Ireland or Costa Rica or Singapore you know, or Dubai, UAE, which are hugely successful despite being relatively small economies. But generally, you know, as you can see there, it's the bigger eco economies attracting FDI. Um, and there are some, like, say, Malaysia, which is maybe not a, a, a huge economy, but it's benefited hugely from a uh, shift of production from China out to other countries in Southeast Asia. Um, and also, it's very strong in both manufacturing and in technology and services. So it's become a, a really strong hub you know, for, for Asia. So that's kind of why it's performing well. Okay. Okay, just drilling into this region as we're in this region, um, it's useful to look, see what's going on. So in this region, Saudi Arabia, UAE, and Egypt, you know, which are the three big economies of the region, again, as I said, related to GDP also, were the most successful in attracting foreign direct investment last year. And then you see the other countries, like Oman, Israel, Morocco, Qatar, Iraq, Bahrain, Algeria, also attracting FDI. But these are definitely the, the three big players you know, in terms of FDI attraction in the region. If we looked at numbers of projects rather than the size of projects, then the UAE would be by far ahead in terms of the number of projects attracted because the UAE is a hub for technology, for regional, regional headquarters and offices for the whole region. But in terms of the bigger projects, of course, like in Saudi Arabia, you maybe have some big chemical projects or petro, pe petrochemicals related projects, which then brings up the numbers. And Egypt you know, is a big, huge economy, growing economy, so has a lot of investment in construction and all different industries. Okay. Um, if we look at um, sub-Saharan Africa, um, South Africa, um, Namibia, Mozambique, Gabon, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Liberia, Nigeria, the major, major economies for FDI last year. Um, normally, Nigeria would be much higher in the rankings, but last year, a lot of the um, oil and gas companies cut back you know, their global expenditure and investments because of COP26 and climate change and so on. So there was a, big sh there was a lot of projects canceled or postponed last year. Um, because of the, the, the commitment to investing in renewables instead of oil and gas. 
So that's kind of why maybe countries like Nigeria and a few other oil, oil, strong oil and gas producing countries were lower in the rankings last year. Now that, we'll talk about that later on, that may be changing now because of the global geopolitical situation. Okay. Source countries, where's the investment coming from? Um, again, there's probably no big surprises here. The US, you know, by far ahead of any other country in terms of a source of Greenfield FDI. You know, if you ask most investment promotion organizations, which country are you targeting? The US is on the list for most, most, uh, most countries around the world as, as the world's biggest economy. And, and as you can see there, the world's biggest source of FDI. Um, after the US, again, probably no surprise, Germany, um, UK. Um, what's interesting is China. So previously, China would have been either after the US or US, Germany, China, or US, Japan, Germany, China. It varies year by year, but always there. But China really cut back outward investment last year. And that can be related to the pandemic. You know, China closed, you know, closed its borders. It still is pretty closed. Um, they're really trying to control the, control the pandemic. Um, and therefore, it's been much harder for Chinese companies to invest overseas. And because they closed the economy for, for two years now, pretty much, um, it also means that the economic growth is much lower than previously was the case. So Chinese companies are under pressure to invest more in the domestic economy rather than through FDI. So this is a very specific year, 2021. Long term, I mean, I think we might show the data. China, we would expect to be there you know, in the top three, again, long term. Um, so this was just because of the pandemic situation that China was ranked lower. But you can see here that's all the G7 economies. South Korea is interesting. So South Korea um, really rose up in the rankings. It's primarily because of one industry, or oh, actually two industries, semiconductors and electric vehicles. So um, semi, uh, South Korea, together with Taiwan, is the world's biggest uh, semiconductor producer. And then in the area of batteries for electric vehicles, um, two of the world's biggest companies, together with the Chinese companies, are in Korea. And like actually, we're involved, and Chris is managing a project with, uh, with, um, with uh, the state of Ohio in the US, where we represent them in, in Korea and other markets. So we help secure a huge battery a production plant um, um, from a South Korean company. I actually live in Turkey, so not too, too far from here. Um, in Turkey last week, Ford announced, and SK, which is a, one of the Korean battery companies, they announced Turkey is gonna be the European hub for their batteries for every single Ford vehicle for Europe. So there's huge investments taking place here, and even now going to emerging markets as well. Yeah, the Ford project that was a finalist between the UK and Turkey were competing for that final project in the end, but in the end they chose Chose, chose Turkey because I think they have more, more, car pro more vehicle production there. Okay, but these are generally on the list of the countries to be targeting, but some of them it is important, like South Korea is for very specific industries, um, whereas the other countries is across, across all industries. Okay. Okay, so this was a poll we did recently. Um, this, this was a poll we did um, early um, in February, actually, so just, uh, just, over, just over a month ago. Um, and this was a res this was a, we had um, 74 different IPAs or EDOs, economic development organizations, responding. And we asked them, you know, which, you know, which countries are you targeting for FDI? Where do you see the best potential? And we thought it was interesting to share the results here, because this is quite a big sample of I I IPAs around the world. And you can see that North America was number one, then Germany, and that reflects the data from last year. Rest of Europe, UK, China, France. So very similar you know, to the global trends. That's where everyone is targeting. There's quite a, a strong alignment there between the data and, and, and you know, what your IPA strategies are. Okay, maybe Japan being the exception where it's much lower down. But again, like China, Japan has been very closed during the pandemic. So it's been much more challenging to attract Japanese investment during the pandemic, um, as with Chinese investment. Okay. Sector trends. So these were the biggest sectors for Greenfield Foreign Direct Investment last year. Um, I'll, I'll talk a bit about some of the, the major ones. So renewable energy, um, again, it was the biggest sector in 2020 as well um, for, for global FDI, it was number one. Um, there was a slight decline in renewable energy, but we expect that to be more of a blip. Maybe, just, uh, maybe there was one or two bigger projects in 2020. Um, we expect investment to continue to be strong. We'll talk about that a lot later. Sec after renewable energy was communications or telecom. There's huge investments going into, into that sector. Semiconductors, as I mentioned, that's the fastest growing sector in the world for FDI. And you see it in the newspapers every day about it. 282% no, growth, 58, $59 billion of projects announced last year. Enormous investments, Germany probably being the most successful country in the world, currently in attract, or Germany and US in attracting um, semiconductor investment. I think Intel has announced a, um, I can't remember the amount, 100 billion, 100 billion dollar, 100 billion euro investment in Europe. And a lot of that's going to Germany and also to Ireland as well. Okay, uh, real estate still, I mean real estate 
historically would have been higher up, but obviously with the pandemic, there's less investment in real estate, but it's coming back now more. Um, so real estate, and then you see the other, other sectors down below. So that kind of shows where the opportunities are um, in, in the last 12 months. Okay. Um, this shows the same data, but by job creation. So a lot of economic development organizations, they maybe care more about jobs and high quality jobs compared to capital investment. So it's interesting to see, okay, you know, where are we gonna get the jobs from? Um, and you can see that the biggest sector last year for job creation, 241,000 FDI jobs created last year were software and IT. Um, and as mentioned, the ICT sector has already recovered from pre-pandemic peaks. Uh, pre-pandemic, um, yeah, peaks. Um, real estate creates a lot of jobs. Uh, business services, consumer products, food, and you see the other sectors there for job creation. So the picture's a bit different. When you look at capital investment, you've got the capital intensive sectors like renewable energy, you know, being big semiconductors, but they don't create that many jobs compared to, say, software or services sectors. Okay, as well as maybe the lower, lower technology manufacturing, like consumer products and food, they're very job, job intensive sectors. Okay. Um, just looking very quickly at this region, um, MENA, very different picture. Chemicals, the biggest sector for, for FDI in this region is obviously a petrochemicals hub of the world, so not, not surprisingly, it's very important. Business services, very important for this region, and also real estate, renewable energy as well. And then you see some of the other sectors are the same as, as the global picture. Um, looking at job creation in this region, um, Similar to the global picture, business services and software and IT are the two biggest sectors for job creation in the, in the Middle East and North Africa region. Okay. Um, okay, looking at Sub-Saharan Africa, as we anticipated a few, a few IPAs from Africa here, which we have. Um, interestingly, in Africa, the biggest sector last year for capital investment was renewable energy. But you can also see Africa is still very strong in conventional energy, um, coal, oil, and gas as well. So the energy sector is dominating. But then also you see metals, which is another very you know, energy-intensive, capital-intensive sector, which is also very strong in Africa um, for, as a source of investment. Um, and then we see telecom. So Africa, huge, huge opportunities for, for telecom because of the growth of the market there. And then you see other kind of traditional uh, and services industries as well. Okay. Um, this just shows the same data for sub-Saharan Africa by jobs, where you can see metals, building materials, software, and other sectors that are the major job-creating sectors in Africa. Okay. Um, in the poll we did last month, um, actually two months ago in February, um, we asked the IPAs, you know, which, are the, which sectors do you think are going to generate the most FDI in your location? And this is the results. So you can see 65% of IPAs said, Software and IT was going to be one of their top three sectors for, for investment. 52 or nearly 53% said renewable energy. So those were by far the top two sectors. And, and this, is based on, um, this is based on 110 IPAs and EDOs. Okay, so that's very interesting. And then you see the other sectors, logistics, life sciences, services, automotive, and then the other sectors with much lower ranking. So that kind of shows you what your peers are, you know, are, are, are targeting, where they expect to have the growth um, for, for FDI um, this year. Okay. We also asked in this poll, um, we had 107 IPAs responding, like how do you see the volume of FDI in your location changing um, in 2022? So you can see the, the most of the IPAs, 51%, so they expect you know, a 10% increase in FDI this year, okay? But 27%, which is quite a big um, number, that's more than a quarter, um, thought that FDI is going to increase by more than 50%. So that's a huge, huge recovery. Um, and it is it's going to be interesting to discuss this as a, as, as a group as well, to get your, your views on this. But what we found is, especially in the US in particular, uh, but also in some European countries, there's been a really, really strong recovery in FDI. Even our, our clients are telling us they're having record levels of inquiries now um, coming in. Um, so it's interesting to see, like, wh where we, where, how do you kind of see yourselves fitting into this picture for your, for your location? Um, only 3.7% thought there was going to be a decline, which is really positive. Okay. Okay. Um, location determinants. What's driving FDI? So um, this is based um, on data for 1,700 projects, FDI projects, looking at what's driving you know, the investment decision-making. 
um, why do they select that particular location? And there's some really interesting trends here, which is why we're sharing it with you now. Um, if we look at 2021, um, the biggest um, motive or determinant for FDI globally was regional market access. Now, Dubai is a fantastic, one of the best examples in the world of this. M most companies investing here, or foreign investors investing here to access a regional market. Okay, not just for the local market. So it's really driven by regional market access. And what's also interesting is that there was a 20% increase in the percentages of companies which cited this motive for their investment, which is quite a big change. Um, and we think that reflects, you know, since the pandemic and, and for other reasons, that companies are looking to regionalize their supply chains and their operations much more than previously was the case. Um, um, in particular, you know, not relying so much on China for their supply chain, which was the case, maybe having you know, one or two or three other regional hubs around the world. And that's what's driving the importance of regional market access. So as, as, if you're trying to like, promote your location for investment, um, promoting your regional market access is likely to be more important now than it was before the pandemic. At the same time, domestic market access is also becoming you know, more important as well. So companies are looking for domestic markets as well. Um, again, we'll talk about this a bit more late, later on in the, in the, in the workshop. Um, skilled workforce availability was the third most important factor, which is, hasn't changed in importance. Still very, very important for investors. And we're, again, we're going to talk about that a lot. Um, and then finally, which we thought was interesting, is technology innovation. So 17%, this is FDI worldwide, remember, not just in one region. 17% of companies said that was a key reason why they invested in a particular location. And there was an increase and the number of companies saying technology innovation, technology and research. So it shows companies are being much more driven than previously was the case by access to technology, research, innovation. And, then, and again, when you're looking to um, um, present and promote your location to investors, it's important to take that into consideration. Um, and we have examples where maybe a company was looking at a, a manufacturing plant and they had two locations shortlisted for it, but then they thought, okay, in the future, maybe we'll do R&D. So then they look, OK, what's the technology and research like in each location? And that determines the final location decision, even for manufacturing investment, because they're looking at the future in terms of doing technology and research. So um, it's, it's really important as part of most sectors you're targeting to also focus on this. Um, finally, just to look at you know, who were the biggest investors. So you know, if we look at um, both numbers of projects and we look at numbers of jobs, Amazon was the world's biggest investor last year in terms of FDI. Um, maybe not, not a big surprise, you know, given the, the expansion of Amazon and, of course, the shift to e-commerce during the pandemic has meant the e-commerce sector has continued to grow massively in most places around the world. Um, it's only become more important, not less important. And then there's a whole range of other companies there, including like Foxconn, you know, which is you know, one of the world's biggest electronics companies and other, other big companies like PwC, the world's biggest professional services companies, all, all creating a lot of jobs around the world through FDI. Okay. Okay, finally, I think for me, um, FDI forecasts. So this is how we're kind of forecasting the recovery of FDI. So in WAPTEC, we have our own FDI forecasting model. Uh, we're just, we've just actually updated the model. Um, so what, what we're forecasting is that by 2024, um, we expect uh, the, the FDI globally, Greenfield FDI, to have recovered to the 2019 levels. So a few years away still, um, just under three years away. And we'll expect a full recovery to have taken place. Okay, and then we expect to you know, continue to grow solidly you know, um, year, year by year. Okay, and so you can see this year we're forecasting about $700 billion of Greenfield FDI. And that's interesting, about $100 billion more than last year. So that's the, uh, the actual increase is quite big in terms, in, terms of, in terms of FDI we're forecasting. Okay, um, this just shows the sectoral trends. I, I would just give you a, a, a few highlights here. So um, the first bar shows the number, amount of FDI globally, Greenfoot FDI 2016. The black bar shows um, 2021. And then we show finally our forecast for 2025. So you can see you know, how we're forecasting FDI by sector globally to change. Um, I think what stands out most of all is definitely renewable energy. Okay, so renewable, we, we actually just updated these forecasts just like a week ago. So um, we're expecting even faster growth of renewable energy. And we'll be talking about the reasons behind that a bit later. Um, so it will be by far the biggest sector we, we, for, we forecast in 2025 for, for, for global FDI. Um, however, we're also forecasting stronger growth than we thought would be the case in, in coal, oil, and gas because of geopolitical events taking place um, and other reasons. So um, we also expect that still to remain a very important source of... Um, source of FDI. Um, 
Real estate, we expect the recovery to continue, you know, from 50 billion last year to 78 billion in 2025. Um, other sectors, we expect maybe a decline compared to 2021. 2021 was a peak year for like communications, telecom, enormous data center investors from companies like Amazon uh, on a huge scale. But once they've already set up their data centers around the world, you know, they, they don't need to make that much more additional investment over the years after that. So we're expecting that actually this was probably the peak year for, for telecom and it will start to, start to go down there. And you can see like same as with semiconductors, that 2021 was the peak year for global FDI. We still expect it to be extremely high in 2025 compared to 2016, but not to reach the same level as it did last year because the investments are taking place already. You don't need to build a semiconductor fab every year if you're, if you're a big company, okay? And then the other sector we're expecting strong growth. Um, well, first of all, at the end, you see hotels and tourism, which is the sector hardest hit out of any sector from the pandemic. Now, we are expecting a strong recovery, you know, to take place in that sector by a very strong recovery by 2025. Um, and then automotive as well, driven by the growth of electric vehicles that we expect to see continuous really strong growth in global FDI in, in the automotive sector as, as companies around the world move into electric vehicle production and you, you need new production facilities, new supply chains related to automotive. Okay. Okay, I think this is my last, is my last slide? Yeah. Okay, so... Last slide, you know, investor perspective, like long term, how are investors looking at FDI? Um, so this was a survey done of, um, of C-level corporate executives, and the survey asked them, um, you know, what do you see as the biggest macro trends impacting long term FDI? The number one um, trend is climate change, as you can see here, if I move out the way a bit. Um, so this was the biggest trend impact on long-term FDI according to corporate executives. 50% of corporate executives said it was climate change, okay? And that's also why we're forecasting s continued strong growth, you know, in renewable energy investment around the world, okay? Secondly, remote working. So we'll be talking about that a bit later as well. Remote working, 22%, uh, so more than one-fifth of executives. So that was the biggest trend, impact, macro trend impacting long-term FDI. And I think that has really big ramifications for economic development organizations, investment promotion agencies. Now, how, how do you adapt your strategy to remote working? And we have a, a group exercise a bit later where maybe you might want to look into that in a bit, in a bit more detail to look at you know, what does this mean for us? What, what can we do about it? But that's the second major trend. Third major trend, Industry 4.0. So that's you know, using artificial intelligence, robotics, automation, everything to, to, um, to, for, for, for manufacturing processes. So nearly one-fifth of investors cited Industry 4.0. That also has quite important ramifications for FDI because previously you could maybe set up your global manufacturing plant in China or in Vietnam or in Mexico um, and serve you know, the whole world or a big part of the world. But now with Industry 4.0, you can set up smaller factories in different parts of the world and they can still be highly productive you know, and, and have other, other, other benefits as well for the investor. Um, so it, it, it may change you know, the, the kind of landscape of FDI. Um, and, and the key location determinants to attract investment. And finally, um, nearshoring and offshoring, 10% of executives cited this. I think if we did the survey right now, that 10% may be higher you know, than, than what it is. I think the, the shift is stronger now towards nearshoring and offshoring than previously was expected to be the case. Um, but that's also definitely, I think, a very, very important trend to watch. And it's one which offers a lot of opportunities for a lot of locations to attract investment, which you know, a few years ago, they probably would not have been able to attract. Um, you, you now can get on the map for investment projects where, as previously, you wouldn't be on the map. Okay. Thank you. Um, open up to Q&A. If anybody has any questions, we can pass the mic around. Or any comments to make, any observations. Yeah, uh, thank you. I just wanted to highlight that... Uh, some data that you showed really uh, resembled to our situation in Hungary because we see that um, China being a little bit closed in the, in the past mm. years, we, we received a massive uh, interest from, from China, I have to say, in, in Hungary and also in the electronic vehicle um, um, production especially and also with energy storage. Mm. So you mentioned SK that they will have their hub in, in Turkey. I have to say that SK is uh, making their third development in Hungary at the moment and we know from about projects because we, we were also uh, on the shortlist 
of, oh. of the possible locations. Okay. So they are not announced yet, but but mm. but we know that they are coming, and we also mm. know where they are coming um, <laughs> because we were not chosen. So, um, but. Um, we, we, we see that, that there is a lot of interest, although I have to say, and this was not okay, not the topic of the, of the forum, but, but you somehow address the, the geopolitical situation, what we have, and Hungary being a neighboring uh, country of, uh, of Ukraine, and, and being in the vicinity of, of this war, really in our neighborhood, we, we um, see that uh, Compared to uh, 2020, we had really like 50% more uh, um, requests mm -hmm. or and visitors uh, really after the the possibilities to to travel again. We mm -hmm. had 50% increase uh, with with the possible projects mm -hmm. or inquiries, and and this year it really like stopped mm -hmm. almost completely. I have to say. So we have a few projects where we are still in negotiations, but, but really the, the new inquiries are, are show a very, very low number mm -hmm. at the moment. So I know that this was not the topic, you know, uh, this new geopolitical situation, but, but uh, in the meaning of, of m maybe not whole Europe, but, but maybe at the moment where we are not, not really sure whether or not uh, the NATO will somehow be involved in this war. It, 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 it's, it's like it's freezing at the mm. moment, I have to say. Yeah. Th th thank you. We actually will cover you know, the war in Ukraine a bit later in terms of the impact on FDI, because it, it, it can't really be ignored, <laughs> as, you, as you said. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Just a quick question. When you talk about renewable energy, uh, the, the projects are centered in, in solar, uh, energy or anything else? Yeah, it's a good question. So, I mean, there, there, there has been um, a big growth, especially in the last two years in, in green hydrogen projects, um, including in your, your own country in Brazil. You know, there was, a, I think, a four, a four or five billion dollar green hydrogen project, I think, from an Israeli, Israeli-led invest investment consortium. Um, which, is one, which was at that time, I think, the biggest ever green hydrogen project in the world. Um, but since then, like Germany, Australia, a few other locations, I think in Scotland, being considered for a project right now. So green hydrogen is definitely a huge growth, a, a huge growth area, has enormous investment potential. But that's kind of related to renewable energy as well. You need to have, you know, the solar or the wind um, to provide the um, excess energy supply, you know, green energy supply for the hydrogen production. So the two things are going together. That's why at the moment there's only a few places like Brazil or, or Germany and Australia which have the renewable energy resources to be able to attract these large-scale green hydrogen. But that's changing, as we see. The continuous investment in renewable, renewable energy, um, which I think globally solar would be the biggest segment, but it does vary country by country. That's then allowing more green hydrogen investments to take place, which will then you know, further increase the amount of investment. Um, but it, do, it, do, it does depend country by country. So, uh, for example, in the UAE here or in this region, it's mainly solar, as would be expected. You know, that's the, the major opportunity. Whereas, for example, in the UK, um, you know, it still has, has the world's biggest offshore inv wind investments. And now the US, they're now finally, you know, investing in, in renewables. Um, and there's a lot of you know, multi-billion dollar tenders, you know, on the East Coast US. Also, um, we, we, we represent the state of Louisiana uh, to attract investment around the world. They're now the, the first southern state to sign up to the to Paris Climate Accord. Um, and now they're putting a, a huge investment into renewables as well. So we expect the wind in industry to really grow massively in the US. And then that will kind of pull up all supply chains related to it as well. So I think solar and has been the main driver, then green hydrogen, but I think wind, you know, because of the US, a lot of, a lot of new investment is going to take place. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, my question is around the promotion of regional access. Um, as a small country, Eswatini is uh, actually embarked on one of it. our strategies is to uh, inform investors that we have a ma wider market than the country. Mm. How then do we balance between this regional access versus competing with the region, with other mm. member states within the region? Because there seem to be that tag of war. We, we seem to find ourselves competing. There are some projects we are not promoting in our regional forums because some of the project promoters feel that there will be competition mm -hmm. rather than complementing each other. 
Great. And which, which country were you from again? Eswatini. Okay. Okay, yeah. So I think yeah, when you look at regional market access, there's, there's um, I, I guess, two main dimensions. You know, one, you know, is, is the kind of trade and investment agreements, yeah? So you know, the Africa, you know, free trade agreement, you know, the potential of that is huge to increase FDI into Africa because you can map out your investments more um, efficiently across Africa, and then that will continue to, to accelerate economic growth, but also for intra-African investment. So countries from one African country to invest in another, that's what we're seeing a lot of right now with the work we're doing in Africa. Um, but you're right, at the uh, so that's one side of it, yes, the, the trade agreements, and you know, unless you have those in place, it's hard, uh, it's hard to attract investment, but this offers huge potential for African countries. Um, and, then, and then you have your kind of strategic location, your infrastructure accessibility, all those factors to be able to access the markets very well which is where, say, in this region, the UAE has amazing infrastructure, so it's been able to become a, a you know, regional hub. Um, but you're right, at the same time, that creates more competition between locations to attract investment because investors have more choice about where they can invest. You know, this is seen most of all for in the European Union, probably more than anywhere else, with the highest number of countries operating in a single market where it's super competitive to attract investment. But because you have the single market, um, the, the actual total volume of investment coming in is higher than would be, would be the case without that regional integration. So I think that's what I would say in the case of you know, any part of the world. You know, the, the, the cake's bigger, you know, but there's more competition you know, for, for each part of it. So that's really about understanding you know, what are your strengths, you know, how, how can you most effectively promote your location, um, um, how can you, you know, differentiate your location compared to other competitors. Um, and, and Chris is going to be going into some of this, actually, all the, all the new techniques you can adopt to try to get yourself considered by investors um, um, compared to your competitors and other locations. Um, but I think Chris will, be, Chris will be covering some of those best practices. But it's a, it's a very good question. Thanks. Yeah. Any, any other comments or questions? I have a question about this forecast for the future inflow of FDI globally. Because one of the factors that's worrying us right now in Poland is inflation rate. We are in range of like 9%, of course, like comparing to Eurozone or US, it's not like the same. But we also see the increase in US and uh, Eurozone. So if, uh, do you take into consideration the inflation rate or future inflation rate in this forecast of FDI? Do you see some yeah. kind of danger in there? or? Yeah, so that yeah. basically that's the question. What might yeah. be an impact of inflation rate yeah. for the future of DI? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the, our, our forecasts are mainly based on the industry growth trends and, and GDP growth trends. So the question is to what extent high inflation, which is a very recent phenomena now, after decade, several decades of having low inflation, um, you know, what impact would that have? And I think the main impact is through the high interest rates. You know, the higher, the higher the interest rates are, then the, the, the more costly it is for companies to raise capital, and therefore, then the less investment they make. So if the interest rates start to get really high, that is likely to have a, a downward impact on FDI. But we, to be honest, we haven't yet included that, you know, in our, in our, in our forecast because we're kind of, we don't really know what's going to happen yet. But if it continues as it, as it does with these very high, even growing inflation, higher interest rates, then you know, it, that, that will become problematic for investment. Yeah. Better to leave your money in the bank if you're an investor. <laughs> you know, you, you need to get a higher return on investment to be able to, you know, to be able to make your money back. Okay. Great. Well, thank you very much. Um, poll now, yes. Do you want to do that? Okay. Just click the next slide. So I guess this is the interactive part. If everyone could get their phone out, um, we've decided to use a mobile app to try and get some of your opinions. So these questions were set as if you were an IPA or a government. So for those of you in consultancy, pretend you're the government of Brazil, pretend you're the government of Nigeria. What are some of the main challenges that you're facing in, in attracting FDI? So, If you scan the QR code on your phone, and we're going to collect the results, and then they'll all come on screen, and we'll see what the most common problems are that people are having.
And I guess some of these will be changing which country you're in, you know, if it's going to be remote working. Um, that's one of the big things we're seeing in Ireland, where I'm from. Um, taking a look at M&A deals, we've seen how important that was for some countries, according to Henry's data earlier on. Um, prioritizing the right sectors, markets. So we're starting to see some of the results. And, and these will change. So only six of you have voted, so keep going. We're, we're not going to read results until we've got at least 10. Interesting, iPros are number one at the minute. Has everyone voted? There's still a few left. Is anyone still finishing off? Okay. So if we take a look at the results. So number one, so half the people in the room says the biggest challenge is identifying, packaging, and promoting investment projects, or IPROs as they're called. So getting it all packaged and taking it to market to get that investment. And this is, you know, if you take a look at Wiper, I think they did a LinkedIn survey last week, and this came out exceptionally high. And we've been having conversations over the past two weeks about doing this exact thing. Um, so it's good that that's come out number one. We'll, we'll touch a little on that today. So we then have got the, a, an even one. So we've high turnover in staff. Well, that, that's a difficult one. I think everyone's at an extent as high turnover, a lot of it we find um, as a small company comes down to career development and, and making sure there's paths open, but we're not really focusing on that as much today. Uh, monitoring and evaluating IPA results, you know, that's always important, and, and I think you know, results are going to change, KPIs are going to change as we look for attracting talent versus projects, remote working is going to change that. Typically, um, a lot, most people when they're monitoring results, they base it on the three categories Henry touched upon. Are we tasked with capital? Are we tasked with job creation or is it on projects? But then other countries, like in the UK, they've, they've changed it from, from that and they're looking for, um, what's their exact terminology, but it's jobs of a certain type. So it has to be over X amount of salary. So they're, they're only focusing on, on that higher level. Then you've got facilitating foreign investment um, in your local startups, SMEs. We, we've seen um, some countries are looking at things like a, a supplier portal database. So, you know, all your local companies are on a portal. When a foreign investor decides to come in, they can make, get introductions and that can start building. All of that, you know, it requires data. You need to know who the startups are. You need to nearly quality check them before you introduce them to foreign investors. So CRM needs to be used there. Um, lead generation techniques, you know, 29% is good. We've got some slides on that. We're going to look at, you know, how lead generation changed during the pandemic, how it's possibly flipping back to what it was before, but slightly different. Um, geopolitical issues. H Henry's going to be touching on that later on. Um, capacity building within your IPA. Lack of political support for the IPA. We, we hear about that quite a lot. Um, we often hear people not being on the same page, so you might have ministry versus IPA, and not everyone's talking the same. And like I, I've done a few times, I'm um, going to countries in Africa um, and bringing in all the stakeholders to tell them why FDI is important. So the ministry, the IPA, the newspapers, believe it or not, the the consultants, because everyone needs to say the same story and to really promote a region, and that that becomes really important. Okay, so. If you put the presentation back on, now we're going to do a little bit of group work. 
So we want you to come into groups of, let's say, five people um, per group. Henry can help mix the groups. And what we want you to do is, of those themes that we had, all the challenges, decide on one of them. Because obviously, no one's a superhuman. You'll not be able to solve them all. So look for one and discuss you know, a potential solution to overcome it that you could do as an IPA. I I'd recommend using one of the ones that had more votes. But it it's completely up to you. Um, come up with an idea of why is it a challenge, what we can do internally uh, with that challenge to overcome it, and then we'll, we'll turn it into a bit of a discussion and, and share ideas from different groups, from different parts of the world, and then we'll be able to feed in um, some of our thoughts on those. Do you want to, Henry, start putting groups together? I think what well, we've probably got about three groups of five. Yeah, maybe just to mix people up, we'll just do numbers. So th three groups, pardon? No, <laughs> it could be, actually, maybe. Yeah, what could be, yeah, it may make sense, you're right. Yes, okay, so we have Africa together, Europe, and then I guess rest of the world. <laughs> so maybe, maybe we can put Africa over here, Europe over here, and then the rest of the world over here, yeah. And uh, we think that one uh, good solution is to, to try to, using different tools, uh, to increase the level of coordination. Uh, one of the examples that I, I can give you is that in Brazil, uh, we, uh, every year, we organize the Brazil Investment Forum is a, a, a big forum in Sao Paulo. And uh, before this uh, forum, we uh, organized uh, uh, a training for the 27 states uh, IPAs uh, uh, in order to, to, to train them to, to promote investments in the different uh, regions of Brazil. So, uh, and we do this with the support of the Inter-American uh, Bank of Development. Is a, it has been a very successful uh, initiative. Uh, so it's a, 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 an example of uh, a solution to overcome this challenge. And, uh, and we know that uh, it is important uh, the engagement of the, the public uh, sector uh, in, in, in some sectors of the economy, for example, uh, infrastructure in Brazil. We have uh, uh, the Ministry of Infrastructure that is very proactive in promoting the projects. So in this case, it, it's been easier to to promote the projects because we are engaged with, engaged with the Ministry of Infrastructure and the different states of Brazil. So uh, uh, we, we realized that in Mexico the, the, and in Honduras uh, the challenges are, uh, are uh, the same. So uh, the problem is uh, how to overcome uh, the integration so it's very important to integrate the different levels to be successful in promoting uh, investments, uh, projects of, uh, for investors. Thank you. I, from what I know, um, every country in the world seems to have this similar challenge. And try to overcome it in different ways. You know, you mentioned um, the training, getting the groups together. That's what we're doing in Colombia. They're, they're going for it the same way, training people, letting them know what's going on. Um, in Sierra Leone, Gambia, Liberia, where we, we've been traveling recently, um, we had to bring all the different stakeholders, IPAs, chambers, ministries, everyone into a room 
to get everyone on the same page, let them know what the goal is and, and how they can all support that so they're driving in the same direction. But then you've got other, you know, you could get worse, it goes to city level. Um, previously I went to Rotterdam in the Netherlands and they have got the national level agency, they have the regional level agency, they have the city level agency, they also have the port and they have one other organization just focusing on life sciences. Every one of them is doing its own investor outreach by itself and no one knows who's speaking to who. So what they did was they invited six different consulting companies in for a week and they had to do an interview with all of these different players to find out what's going on and then come up with a recommendation on, you know, should they be having one shared CRM? Should they, where we decided one of the things they needed was, you know, a website with links to the relevant people. So if I'm going on to NFIA's website, I should be able to say, I'm interested in life sciences and then it directs me to the different cities and then you can make connections. And I, I guess the UK, they often, like, at the embassies overseas will be getting a lot of leads, they'll come back to HQ and then they'll be siphoned down through, through the national pipeline to the different cities. But even then when, when I hear UK, I think it goes really well, but there's complaints from other cities that it's a London first approach or the major city always gets the leads. And it, it's a common issue I think that, that we're all hearing and it's a, I think a lot of communication, a lot of openness, knowing that you know, if more projects come to one country, then everyone benefits. So you are competing to an extent, but it should be, say, Brazil first, and then everyone will benefit from it, particularly now where, you know, remote working is more important, and, and that's going to be a growing trend. So people don't, you know, they might not have a big office, and they might have one small office people commute in, but there's no, well, do you have any idea in terms of the best approach to do it? Okay, so that's the first. Will we go to um, Africa next? Who's speaking? Yep. Uh, uh, thank you, Chris. Um, the challenge we picked is the lack of political support for IPAs and private sector. Um, our group was consistently made, uh, uh, consist of uh, the private sector. Um, fortunately, all from Nigeria. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just an IPA from, I think it's a regional IPA in Nigeria and Eswatini. Uh, the solution we, we, solutions we came up with, the first one was actually working with the Reserve Bank um, for incentives that are specific in, in terms of, uh, especially when we talk of uh, uh, the foreign exchange regulations. Um, the concern there was the uh, fluctuation of the exchange rate, you know, for the local local currency. The second one is protection uh, investor protection mechanism that would be specific uh, to that particular country, so that we can avoid uh, uh, political somersaulting in terms of specific specific. Uh, uh, regulations and understanding the um, investment processes of each of the countries and what investors are looking for. The third uh, solution we are recommending is the positioning of the reporting line. That is mainly the IPAs be streamlined to report directly to the head of state or the prime minister, depending on the structure of the, the, the country, so that at least we get their political will. Thank you and buy in. You covered everything. Uh, I have no comment, Henry. <laughs> Do you? No? A star pupils. <laughs> um, finally, Europe. We, we picked, I think, Mission Impossible somehow <laughs> because uh, we, we really could not pick any other topic than the geopolitical situation. I think. Uh, uh, no other topic is that important and, and really critical at the moment. So I think maybe all the others we could solve, but nevertheless, we, we really uh, wanted to put our thoughts together. And um, when defining the issue regarding uh, foreign direct investment, then uh, we thought that um, uh, this un uncertainty, what we, what we see is um, putting some investments on hold not only the inquiries, but uh, in worst case, even project where there was already a decision, but uh, maybe uh, these get on hold. 
The other one is also that uh, prices are escalating regarding, reg for example, the construction of a facility hall or something like that. So um, this uh, is uh, really um, critical for, for, for investors. And then uh, what we thought, what we can do uh, with really not having a, a possibility to have an impact on the situation, but what we can do on a local level maybe Whereas uh, IPs, um, we can do a scenario planning and see uh, what if it, it, uh, it takes one month, several months, what we can do also regarding the, the refugee situation and, and also uh, finding some possibilities. What we, if we can um, integrate these, uh, these refugees into our uh, countries? What, what if uh, they can be our uh, future employees? Because what you also um, mentioned that, um, that uh, having um, uh, HR, so having, having uh, a good labor market is also always a question. It's, it, it, it's uh, the same as, as it used to be, but it's important. And, and if we can show that we are more and more people, then this can be a possibility, of course. But uh, the challenge is that we don't really know how long they will stay. Um, also, what we can do is uh, some kind of uh, uh, location comparison, what we can show like Europe to other regions and also maybe within, within Europe. Um, re that what we discussed was the electricity prices, for example, that it's much higher than in China. But this is a regional issue, so it's not a Hungarian issue, it's, it's, it's the same. Um, um, so, <laughs> okay, now you can do it, good. Oh, no, it's, well, it just automatically updated on, on the app. I uh, could have taken some time to do hands in the air. Okay, so we keep going. So far, number one, not surprisingly, is uh, website content. It tends to be number one in everything marketing related. Closely followed by um, investor guide and sector brochures. Then social media. Then benchmarking studies. Okay, so we've got 12, there should be a couple more people. Henry, are you able to present the results? Oh, the IT team have left. <laughs> Must be a coffee break. Okay, well, I can give the results. So 69% of, uh, oh, we're back. Okay, so we can see the results. So 69% of people um, said website is number one, followed by subsector pitch decks, followed by iPro, oh, the numbers aren't different, sorry. Um, investor guides number two, social media, um, sector and subsector pitch decks, specific, sector specific brochures and flyers, videos, and not many people are currently looking at virtual reality. I can say I do a lot of work in the US and that's where they've moved to. So as an example, um, 
I'm working with the state of Louisiana, and they want to target FDI from everywhere in the world, but they know they can't travel everywhere. So they have um, created videos of all the buildings, and they've created them on Oculus goggles, and they post them out to investors. So investors can actually walk through buildings and take their FDI to the next level. And this is, you know, there was EDA funding, it was called in the US, but a lot of people are moving into virtual reality, particularly if you live somewhere like North Dakota, which isn't an easy place to fly to. So they'll be sending these to site selectors so they can start seeing what's around. Then they're even creating like augmented reality. So you'll get your, your build or your space and then they'll build, build it in front of your eyes and you can see what you'll be moving into. So it's definitely not taken off um, in Europe and, and the rest of the world as yet, but it will be coming. Videos, seen as semi-important. Um, benchmarking studies, again, semi-important. I imagine there's gonna be benchmarking data on your sector brochures anyway, so the benchmarking has been done. Okay, so if you just go to the presentation, um, we're gonna go a bit deeper into some of these things that we see going on. So we're gonna take a look at techniques for attracting investment, and it came up, you know, we, we talked about lead generation, we've talked about marketing, you know, we've talked about iPros, all of these have come up as interesting points. So what we're gonna look at is just some different techniques. Okay, so we're taking a look at uncertain times and really a little bit of the shift over the past three years. And if we keep it on three themes, marketing, attraction, and aftercare. So the crux of a lot of what we do is somewhere within this. And, and each of these have changed, I'd say, pretty dramatically um, over the past three years. So if we begin with marketing. Okay, so what techniques are there? And you touched on some. I, I've removed some which have you know, remained the same. I'm not going to talk about events because events are events. They, they've been the same. They haven't changed. But we'll talk a little bit about websites. Um, it's always ranked number one. You guys ranked it number one. It's not going to change. But what has changed about websites is they're more of a proactive tool. You're no longer waiting on people to come to you. You need to get your message out to others. You need to you know, have tools built into your website. You need to monitor who's on your website. Social media, you know, extremely low cost, but very highly effective. You know, we're now running a lot of LinkedIn campaigns for governments, and you can be so super targeted in this. And, and it, while it's marketing, it goes into lead generation if you're using it properly. Value propositions, again, you've always done them, but they've changed so much. You know, five years ago, I remember every IPA I ever spoke to said, we're looking for financial services, software and IT and renewable energy. Now we're looking at, you know, subsectors. we're looking at solar panels, we're looking at electric vehicles, and you have to get much more niche when you're speaking to companies. Uh, you know, it's, people are asking us, how many graduates in cybersecurity do you have each year? That, tend it not to be on a value proposition before. Then videos and advertising. So for many years, I worked at the Financial Times in, in their FDI division. And personally, I wasn't um, the biggest advocate of advertising. You know, lots of people question, question advertising. But following GDPR in Europe, following um, you know, the data protection in Korea, in Japan, in Canada, California, advertising has started to take off again. As long as you're doing it for the right reasons, usually to get out a new message, maybe a new policy, new airports, something to say, then advertising can be beneficial. So if we touch upon some of these a little bit. So your website, as I said, it's always, you know, number one um, in terms of any way people, if you ask investors, how do they find out about a region? They typically go to Google. So the, the first thing to do is make sure you're the number one thing that comes up on Google. It's pretty easy to say. But if you do it right, you know, from data they're saying you can get 10 to 20% more inquiries and good inquiries. And, you know, as Wavtech, even going to the private sector, we invest more now in our website and our digital marketing than we've ever done before. And leads come to us while we can no longer travel to meet people. So what should be on your website? And, of course, you know, usually I would go about 10 slides in this, but I'm not going to waste that much time. You know, first, they have targeted content. A few things to ask yourself is, you know, don't write what you want to say. Write what people want to hear. 
You know, you need to think of yourself as an investor. If you're going onto a website, what do you want to find? I think too many IPAs just write everything they know about their location, and it's not relevant for an investor. So have it, you know, short and sweet. Now, I don't think I've got the data up there, but it's like the image is processed so many thousand times quicker than words. So think of that. Use infographics. Use something to capture people's attention. Keep things short and sweet. You know, I often find, what do I look at when I go to an IPA website? It's the top 10 reasons for this location, and then you go into the sectors. You're not going to read, you know, when, when a country was formed and every part of data about the history. You're wanting to know what is there now and why should I be there? Make it, you know, make the important things visible. And that tends to be from, all, we've done a lot of surveys to see what should be on websites. In North America, incentives is the number one thing people want to see. Demographic data, testimonials. You know, you need, it's such an easy thing to do. Which companies are already here? Have the logos, have a few quotes. If you want, have some videos so it's not all just text. Use of maps. And there's so many, I'll, I'll show some examples of maps, but you know, you can have GIS maps showing your data. You can have, you know, heat maps showing which region is the hottest for what. You, you can have um, key employer lists and, and have them mapped out. You can have mapped out your, your current FDI. You can have mapped out your iPros. You know, all of this stuff can go on a map rather than heavy text. Then think about tools. You know, I've said lead identification tools. There, there's some, there's like, it's called Leadly, and there's one called Lead Forensics. And basically, it's a, a very low cost. I think we pay, it's a couple of thousand dollars a year. And it will tell you which company is on your website. It will all go into your tracking. It doesn't work so well when people are working remotely. It will just be their internet providers. But if people are in the office, it will say, company X based here has been on your website. It doesn't tell you the person, but it allows you to know who's interested, particularly if you cross-reference it against your CRM and who you're speaking with. You know, search, search engine, make sure that you're found. If, you know, you're... Um, your, your region is big in cybersecurity. Make sure if I type cybersecurity Africa that your location comes up quite high. Check your performance. Like our marketing team every month send a report. Number of people on the website, what pages they spend most of their time on, what people download, number of inquiries. Then we can check what we're doing well, how we can improve it. And, and you're the same. You need to know what people spend time on, even on videos. Right? If you look at your video stats, I, I bet you about 20, 30% of the people only watch the first 30 seconds of your video, and then they switch off. So should you have a long video, or should your video be one minute? Think about things like this as you see what people are doing on your website. Now with GDPR, um, or any data protection, have some sort of data capture. You know, s sign up to download something, or sign up to our newsletter, or sign up get that data, because that means you're able to market to them and you're able to keep engaging with, with those locations, or those companies, sorry. You know, you're, make sure you track your inquiries. You want to know what percent of companies which landed in your region came via your website. And if you're not tracking those inquiries, you never really know where that lead originated from. You know, targeted content, you know, if you look at Costa Rica, they, they regularly win awards. I think this one was for UNCTAD. But don't need to read the text. As soon as I looked at it, things I looked, you know, what technologies are present? Just bam, bam, bam. There's not a lot of words. It's just telling me what. Enabling capabilities. That's exactly what they're doing. Then you're also able to get an image. And straight away, your eyes are directed at this, and you want to find out more about it. You know, nothing here is super complex. In, in fact, it's the opposite. They stripped it back and made it very easy. Mapping. So here in Dubai, we, we build them um, a real-time map where they list every single FDI project, whether that's Greenfield, M&A, joint ventures, um, all of it, new forms of investment. You can click on those numbers, and it will list you who the investor is. Why is this interesting? Firstly, it's extremely transparent. You know, you, you know exactly who's here. Secondly, some countries cluster. So like Japanese companies might see where all the other Japanese companies are and decide this is a good area to be. Maybe there's partnerships to be made. Maybe there's suppliers. But it's all very open. 
Then you're able within it to download annual reports, see the full FDI ecosystem, all extremely easy done through mapping technology. Social media, you know, this is something which I'm pretty keen on. It's why do we do it? And I think that's a question that not enough people ask. Everyone does social media because we're meant to do social media, right? It's not why am I doing it? What am I getting from it? It's ah, I better check Facebook or I need to do this and that. Why you're doing it is instant communication. You know, if you're if you're sitting in Brazil and you want to get a message to companies in Japan, this is by far the quickest way to go global with, with any messaging you're doing. It's extremely low cost. You know, even it with LinkedIn, if you pay for, for instance, we, we've done a lot of testing in this. We want it to target site selectors in the east coast of the US. We wanted them all to be at a minimum VP level, and we chose, of the east coast, I think we chose six states. And we were like, let's put $500 against this. And they guaranteed, that they give you an algorithm and said you will get 12 leads from this. 12 leads from $500. And, and that was for our incentives database. We, we, did a, we did a survey for a country in Africa, for Sierra Leone, on agribusiness. And we went out and we spoke to all the companies individually. But we thought we'll also get it on LinkedIn to, to agribusiness companies, particularly based in Nigeria, who might be interested in Sierra Leone. 47 people filled out that survey just on LinkedIn. And again, extremely low cost to do that, even if you're paying on it. You know, you can expand your reach. What I also like and I say about LinkedIn is you're connected to people, not companies. So if a person leaves company X and goes to company Y, you're still connected. And the chance is if someone leaves Ford, they're going to go to Lexus or to another auto company. And that could be a new lead for you because you're connected to more than the company. But some best practice. First, don't do it for the sake of doing it. You know, have something in mind. Post regularly. Mix it up. You know, have images, have videos. And just little tips to give you. One is um, on every article you post, it now tells you how many minutes it takes to read it. If you're like me, if it's over four minutes, I'm not clicking on that. So think about what your attention span is and if you're going to read a 14-minute article on LinkedIn. Have, if you can, have someone, you don't need a dedicated manager, you need someone to give you tips. So we brought someone in from LinkedIn to give us all tips. And even little things, like if you look at my URL on LinkedIn, it doesn't have all of those numbers and letters after it. They just teach you how to clean that up. And I'm, I don't know how many people in here know, if you go on LinkedIn and you say, find people around me, it will tell me everyone in here on LinkedIn, and I can add you in one minute. We don't need to exchange business cards, don't need to do all of that. LinkedIn can help you do that. Choose you know, what countries you're focusing on because LinkedIn's not gonna work in China. You, know, you need to work out the right medium for which country. Even in Germany, you might use, is it Sing or Xing, um, which is used um, over that. So have a think. You know, some countries prefer Facebook, some Twitter, and, and know which you're targeting and where they get it. China, you might want WeChat, Weibo, things like this. Track your performance. Not only yours, but your company's. If you look at the analytics you get now, you can get on a weekly basis your number of new followers, how you're doing against competing locations, the level of people who is following you, where they come from. So let's say if you're, you know, Pomerania, and, and the number one people following you are from Bangalore and India. That's interesting, because you might not know why. And if you start doing more targeted campaigns towards Bangalore, maybe there's something about there and Pomerania that you don't know about. And that's what like, we look regularly to try and understand. For us, the majority of ours are from Belfast, because that's where our staff are, but, and, and then from Bangalore also, because our office is there. But it's worth looking into to that, so you can then do targeted campaigns. Join relevant groups. You know, social media, you opt in, right? You don't opt out. Which means if you're on Twitter, you have chosen who to follow. So if people follow, follow you, they have chosen to do that. So use that. These are people who want to hear what you have to say. So get your message out to them regularly. You know, you can do paid campaigns. You know, I, I do think with um, LinkedIn is the best for, for business development. You know, you, you can choose your companies. 
like DIT, I, I worked on a campaign with them and they were, let's say, looking at e-commerce companies. They were looking at um, above, as I say, VP level, but they had a list of companies that they wanted to reach out to. So all of their targeted promotion was to these companies. So you can keep drilling into that. Also share, you know, a, another tip I got given on LinkedIn is within your organization and, and other influencers that you know, create like a WhatsApp group. So if say I post something, I, I know other people involved in FDI, I just put a message on the WhatsApp group and said, could you share this with your networks? And get, especially if they're not in your organization, but they're in a network you're friends with, get them to share it and then your content will grow and you'll get more from it each time. Consider time zones. You know, use one of these, um, what's it called? I can't remember the name, but where you can program in what time your tweets are going to go out. So, you know, if you're wanting to hit the Asian market, but you're in Brazil, you just program, is it Hootsuite? Yes. You have, have it all programmed in, so you're going to be getting the markets you're wanting to focus on. And, and then think about when do people look at social media? Like I was reading recently, and it tends to be when you wake up, it tends to be on your way to work, then there is a lull until lunchtime, then there is a lull until your way home, and then in the evening, people tend to get like their iPad or something out and check. So think about those timings when you're going to be doing it, because quite often at 11 a.m., people are in meetings, they're, they're in emails, and, and that's not when they're checking their social media. Again, it's just some channels to consider. Value propositions. We, we talked, mentioned it before, but they have to drill right down. And you're going to be, like, now we're looking at fintech. You know, so world leader in the share of electronic payments. Th this is all the sort of stuff you need with investors now. And, you know, when, when it looks at number of talent, the highly skilled, we were working with um, Calgary in Canada. And usually when we're working with North American clients, companies say to us, you know, what buildings are available? They ask us for a list of available talent. That is all they cared about. Tell me about all your graduates each year. And that's how they make their investment decision. So you see, it's going into things. I, I don't even know what some of it, you know, we can... Take a look, blockchain, gamification, virtual reality, augmented intelligence. So all of these are keywords that are going to pop up on, on search engines. One we did, um, just as a, a bit of a contents page, was when we, I think this was last, uh, April last year, we were really looking for DIT at e-commerce. And, and we began by, well, what has the UK got to offer? So that was more about internally learning, so, so they know exactly the size of the e-commerce industry in the UK. Then, why UK? We wrote competitive advantage, it could be just why UK, where we go in and look at, well, the readiness, the talent pool, things that are important here. Benchmarking, you know, I, I know people didn't vote that high, but when we speak to investors, they do like to know, you know, if you say a number, like we have 150,000 employees in cybersecurity, against what? Like, compare that against something, it's just a number. If, if, if you don't have that comparison, is that high, is it low, I'm, I'm not sure. Shows the opportunities in the UK and then, you know, a bit like testimonials, some track record in companies who have set up. So again, this is how we're, we're now starting to look. We looked at iPros um, and really, you know, having them packaged, it's not just, a, you know, with iPros, I guess there's a few things. Firstly, you have to identify the investment opportunity. Next, you have to look at the feasibility study, work out the return on investment. Then you need to package it. Then you need to market it. So you've got like four aspects to, to look at, but the very first one is identifying what the opportunities are. And this was um, when we worked with Ukraine Invest, I think that's 2020, um, just to identify within some of the different, within real, within airports, and uh, within sea, seaports. And everything is saying what size the market is. So annually serves 5.7 million passengers and looking at what the investment amount. When you click through, it will be giving you things like your return on investment. And another good example we've seen, probably the best one, Henry, we've seen for iPros was Invest Sao Paulo, wasn't it? So it was here maybe about four years ago. Invest Sao Paulo were at the event, and you know, usually when we speak to IPAs, we see their brochures about the different sectors. We've seen um, a PowerPoint presentation on an iPad, and all it was was 13 slides showing us 13 opportunities. And it's a very different way, you know, marketing an opportunity, and that's probably
probably a good idea for, for this conference or, or for this region, you know, coming with, with those opportunities. I'll not spend much time on videos and advertising, but as I said, I think it is increased again um, following GDPR. You know, video content is being used throughout websites. People are creating YouTube channels. Um, problem is a lot of people don't keep them up to date. It's always a great idea to create channels, but then not do anything. Some of the best practice. You know, when should you advertise? Well, one, if you're going to a new market. So if you're thinking of, you know, the Gulf being a key market for you moving forward, getting some branding, some awareness of your region here b before you arrive c can be helpful, particularly if there's publications, you know, which are going throughout Expo. You know, wh when you're attending an event, again, MIPAM is a good example. Um, MIPAM is in Cannes, it's a real estate event, and a lot of advertisers would be, you know, in the FT newspaper, in local papers, because they're distributed throughout the conference. So every single attendee is picking one of those up and seeing about your region. And then when you've news worth sharing. You know, I, I often find new flight routes is interesting, new incentives policies, um, things like that tends to be interesting. Then you need to look at what medium, because you know, if you take a look at a, the Wall Street Journal or the FT, I think a one-page advert is $125,000. So, is that a good use of budget, is the question. But then you, you go lo f more local, and well, I don't, local newspapers don't get out to as many companies, so some people go towards you know, specialist publications, um, whether it's like Automotive Weekly, if it's um, Site Selection Magazine, FDI Magazine, because they're going out to the corporates. And then others are going online. Um, people think online, it means you know, we can track, we can get metrics. But even that, you know, there's so many corruptions behind it. People could just have other people clicking on it and just getting you your click-throughs. So just doing a bit of each, and knowing why you do it. You know, like for advertising, it's about raising awareness, not about lead generation. I, at once, someone I seen got an advert, and then they told me they got no leads from it. But the reality is, do you ever look at an advert and then go online and send an inquiry? You know, it's just getting it in your head that, when the time is right, that's what I should be looking at. But a few cases you can look at, again, if you look at Costa Rica, they keep them short, you know, 34 seconds. That's, you know, under a minute. Keeping them at that is short. You, keeping it so you can watch a video or you can download a brief, it's up to you. Whatever way you want your information, you can get it on their website. You then have got Chile, you know, not only do they have their videos, they have webinars. So at any stage, you can go in and find a little bit more about investment opportunities. You can watch older webinars if you want to. So they've got a full investor toolkit. So the investor can choose, you know. You've got your guide at the beginning, tenders and portfolios, some data, webinars, eBooks, FDI reports. You've got everything you can need. Okay, so that's some of marketing. As I say, didn't put in events because they haven't really changed. So attraction techniques. And I always like using some data to let people realize how difficult lead generation is. So firstly, investor targeting and lead generation are pretty similar. So the, the goal is to you know, identify companies which we're not considering your location. That's the, you know, it's whether it's through marketing, whether it's through identifying companies, building lists. It is to get people coming to your location that would not have been without your intervention. So for many IPAs, not all, that this is the most important thing that, that you do. It's finding new businesses to set up. In our opinion, very few who are doing it best practice. Most who are doing it tend to follow you know, the private sector, and I, I think IDA would be an example in Ireland um, for doing that. So some questions, just uh, following our, our surveys and work we've ever done. So what percentage of companies, so you're already on the short list, this company's considering your location. What percent of those actually will set up in your location? Anyone, a percentage? 10 to 15? Less? Anyone saying higher? 5%? Okay, well, for the world's top IPAs, and this is where you look at Singapore, Ireland, and Costa Rica, 
they say 50%. Half of investors who have considered going to Ireland choose to set up there. If you take a look at typical best practice from, from countries around the world, they're saying 20 to 25%. And a typical location is saying 10 to 15%. So that's really how tough this is. But now we're going to play a game and work through those numbers. So let's say we want to attract $100 million and 2,000 jobs from a new investor. Okay, and that means you need 10 project successes. If we use an average size project of 10 million and 200 jobs. Okay, so project success is when that company has officially announced they're going to your region. So that's, you know, we're all happy then. If we use, say, 20% closure rate, that means you need 50 active projects with a decision base this year. And that's a company which is a current live project. They already have the money in place and they're ready to do something. So you need to have 50 of those active to get those 10. Meaning, you need to have 250 qualified prospects. And now a qualified prospect is a company with a clear FDI plan and they're going to invest within the next two to three years. That's typically what a consultant calls a lead. So you need 250 of those to get your 10 successes, which means you need to engage with about 1,250 companies to find those. You know, so that's taking a look at a, a company with a rationale to engage with. Now, and that, this is all based on you know, a conversion rate of 20%. If we're working on a less conversion rate, you need to be looking at about 2,000 companies to get those successes. If it's a brand new investment, which you know, isn't on your short list already. So this is a challenge. You know, and we often say you know, the difference between business and politics because this takes a long time, whereas politics is more short term. So we need to somehow close this gap. But it gets worse. Right? So the average length of time from the first contact with the lead to when they have a project to compete for is about 18 to 24 months. So like, if you start meeting with leads here, the chances is their project isn't going to be in six months or they've already thought about where to go. It's going to be in a, a year, two years. And then after that announcement, typically it's another six to 12 months. Right? So we, we usually start this with a picture of a mayor cutting a ribbon. Um, so at the end we say, it's going to take three years before that ribbon can be cut. So that's the challenge of lead generation. And, and pre-pandemic, post-pandemic, it's always the same. Like the challenge will remain. What we're now going to look at is how it's changing. So as we said, the, the, the money you invest, the lead generation you do now, you don't feel the impact of that on, on your community for, for another couple of years. But the thing that has remained the same is in, in our heads, in how you do lead generation, the, the, the points of it are still the same, right? You need to contact a company, whether that's via LinkedIn, whether that's by phone, whatever, you need to contact them. You then need to introduce your location, you know, and, and who you are. You then need to meet them. That, that can be in person um, over the years. It, last couple of years, it's been by Zoom. So then you need to qualify them on that meeting. Like, is this company going to be a real lead? Am I going to waste any more time? Then you need to nurture it. And that, that's the part which takes some time. You know, you're in your active project here, nurturing that company, and then close it. So that's working with your local stakeholders. So this stays the same. It's just different aspects of this has changed during pandemic. Which companies is usually the first question. Like, who, how should I pick the companies I want to be targeting? And we always think there has to be a criteria. You know, there's what, three, 400 million companies in the world. How do you narrow it down except for your key sector? You know, it can be, do they have a current strategy? Go reading on their news, checking that out. Um, have they been growing? Have they raised any financing? Um, do they have R&D spending increasing? Have they raised currency in a, a different country? Um, you'll want to look at, are they already in your region? Can we look to expand what they do? You might want, depending you know, on your SDGs, look at people with strong CSRs that are going to be a good fit for your location. You can take a look at some of the others, but I'll not go through each one. But during the pandemic, prior to the pandemic, this is how we did it. You know, we, we went to events, we met face to face, you know, we, we spoke to intermediaries, real estate agents, accountants, um, all of them. 
that kind of died a little bit. Um, well, trade shows and seminars and events died 100%. Face-to-face -face meetings. We, we still have not, for any client in the world, we have not conducted a roadshow yet where they've actually traveled to the UK or to any other country and met face-to-face. -face. Our first one is going to be at the beginning of June since November 2019. So still, it's coming back now. We're feeling it a little bit, not completely. So we've been doing more campaigns. Social media campaigns has been the biggest change we've had in our business. You know, we now believe, beforehand for us, lead generation was more about relationships, calling, emailing. Now it's a three-pronged attack. One, it's traditional, calling, emailing. Two, it's digital media. And three, it's data. You know, looking for the right companies and drilling it down before you even engage with the company so you have a rationale to speak to them. You know, if I speak to someone, I can say, oh, I see that you recently suggested that you're raising funding and you want to grow your cybersecurity com company in the US. Did you know that Pasco, Florida has got X, Y, and Z? So you have to understand that it's not just cold calling. An example of, again, how things changed heavily is webinars. Like, I'm sure everyone in this room is bored of the word webinar. Um, but through the pandemic, this is how every IPA we spoke to started. It's like we're going to do a webinar to tell the world we're still open for business. We're going to build our leads. And it was fantastic at the beginning. You know, we had about two, 300 people coming to each webinar. By now, it's maybe 30, 40 people um, with a 50% dropout. But one of the biggest programs um, we did was actually with Abu Dhabi, the investment office. And it, it was a challenge, it was a four month project, but they wanted to do 22 sector specific webinars in four months um, to see the markets they wanted. But what was interesting is every market is different. I'll give you two very different examples is in China. So it's a webinar, but they booked a room in China and all the companies went in, but they got Abu Dhabi dialed into it and give a webinar to all the companies in a room. So it was like an old fashioned event but the people who were hosting it weren't invited. So it'd be like having a party but not being allowed to go to your own house. You, you then have, let's say in Japan. In, in Japan, the, the method was anyone who registered, our team had to have a one-on-one -on -one conversation to see that they were the right people to come along. But what's interesting in that is 52 people registered and 51 showed up. So they, they had these conversations and we started learning different things on them. So we did this. We, we also learned a lot throughout. We, we created their invites. But what we did throughout was a lot of these polls, like we did with you today. But the polls would be things like, what are your investment plans over the next two or three years? What drives, you know, what are your decisions, drivers, uh, the motives behind where you choose where to go? So we are getting a lot of intelligence from companies. And from this, you know, we get 10,000 companies targeted, 1,000 came. Of those, 250 companies said we're considering the Middle East. So they got 250 leads. And then we also set up, from the leads, we set up 100 meetings. So again, this was all, wouldn't have been done in 2018, 2019. This entire thing was done virtually. Then you can do something much more niche. You know, like when you're looking at Japan, Detroit, we're looking at automotive and advanced man manufacturing and really mobility. So. They didn't want a lot of people. They wanted the right people in the room. I think they, they went for about 40, 50 people would go along to that. And, and Detroit, the reason they did this was because every single year they went to Japan twice. And they felt they needed to keep these relationships, keep them warm, so they could get back out there. And still, they're not able to travel. Virtual lead generation is something else. You know, th this has changed a lot. It's, it used to be we would be setting up meetings in person, but we're working for the Ministry of Foreign Affairs here in the UAE, and we're working in 19 countries around the world. So each of their ambassadors in 19 countries is working with us, and we have to set up meetings in their key sectors. That's half of the project. The other half is that target, identifying companies they should be looking to engage with, and, and just feeding, basically drip feeding them companies and intelligence every month. So again, th this is ongoing at the minute, but we identified the 1,000 companies first. We've had to do like four or five training workshops to the embassies to make sure you know, the embassies know how to conduct the meeting as well as HQ. 
um, because quite often embassies aren't trained up in terms of doing the, the actual investor attraction and closing business. Usually they open the doors um, and we were trying to get it further down the line. So we, yeah, we have to set up like 119 meetings, I think, by the end of June. Another one I mentioned before was Calgary. And again, all virtual, which, which is a challenge in itself. You know, you don't build the rapport with the client the same. You're having a virtual meeting to understand what Calgary has to offer. So we always begin, we always begin with corporate intelligence. Data is king, right? There's no point speaking to 3,000 companies if I can do research and speak to 150. So finding the right companies. Then, again, we did our multi-channel outreach, creating profiles. Usually, you know, we do a brief. We sit down with Calgary before they do their week's meetings and tell them about every meeting, who you're going to meet, what you're going to talk about, and then we'll go to the meeting, we'll make notes and debrief them. All of this had to be virtual. But what was successful, we managed to get them one project secured. And that was, you know, again, it was small because there's not huge manufacturing happening last year as much. It was a small um, North American headquarters of a software company. But it is coming back, you know, like I, my opinion, I'm starting to feel that, you know, people are on the road again. Look at everyone here, right? As a start, you're all here. Trade shows are happening. My, my colleague was at MIPAM in Cannes about um, two weeks ago, and he said there was about 70% of the usual attendants were there. And the majority of the people not there were from the UK who, who actually decided to not do as much in MIPAM this year. So it, it was packed. Roadshows, as I said, we've got our first one happening in June. So particularly from the US, the US clients that I know are eager to get on the road again and, and get out to market and meet companies in person. And events are happening, you know, around Expo, there, there were lots, I'm sure everyone's had a wander around, but there's been so many different events which have been happening and different markets are, are opening. So the key question, what has changed? You know, has there been any long-term change and I'll put a caveat, this is just my opinions. Um, you guys might not agree. But firstly, I think moving forward, it's gonna be more of a hybrid. I don't think everyone will be on flights the same as they used to, particularly if events offer a virtual platform. I think we'll choose more carefully what events we'll go to. Hopefully people start looking at the return on investment from events, because I don't think that's ever done properly. Um, should we be going every year to the same events or should we be changing it each year? I think, what else? It's going to be, you know, it used to be marketing and business development. To me, it needs to be much more integrated. You know, whatever business development are focusing on, marketing should be focusing their efforts. And, and there should be like a business development and marketing combined plan for, for the year, two years um, on what you're focusing on. Technology, you know, it's being used a lot more, whether that's company databases, there, there's a lot, whether it's FDI databases, leads databases, all, there's so many out there now. I, if I was an IPA, I don't know how you choose. There's just so many to look at and pick the right one. But you've that, you've then website tools, hopefully bringing you more leads. You know, you, something really simple but, and cheap, we use a live chat on our website, 400 US dollars a year, but there's also a free version. We get more inquiries through live chat than we do via email. Like all of our best inquiries come via chat. So such a low cost solution. And even if you're not available 24 seven, which it, you'll not be, it just says leave your email. So you get the inquiry anyway. So there's no negative to having that chat on your website. And yeah, we've got it on every tool and all of our clients contact us via it. Virtual reality, you know, people are gonna, stop traveling as much. Whether that's, uh, I've even got friends in the US who don't want to travel to Europe because of the war. They, they don't even want to come to the UK. They're, they just, they're scared of Europe. So like virtual reality, all of these things are gonna start coming in for people to take a site selection decision a little further. And also the environment. People aren't gonna want to always be on flights. So that, that'll change. I think you guys, there, there's two th ways I've seen this go. Now, either a government says to us, we, we're looking for 50 leads and we don't care where they come from because it's all virtual. So I, I'm not, I no longer have a market focus on, on China, Japan, and UK. I just don't care. So we're getting that. 
but then we're also getting more targeted. Like some people saying we're only going to be focusing on, I think, was it Ohio, or looking at southern China um, and, and Taiwan as a market. So they've really defined where they're looking at, and others are defining the, the subsector that they're only going to focus on and waste no more time. And I think a lot of folks are refocusing their target markets. You know, China, I, I think it was yesterday I read, they're shutting down Shanghai again. So people are refocusing. It's like, I can't target China. I can't target Japan. Korea is only semi-opening, um, but I still have to quarantine. So more people are going to be targeting Europe, Gulf, and North America because they're open, whereas Asia is still opening quite slowly. And with that said, it means everyone has to be a little more agile because who knows when our next lockdown or, you know, anything can happen. So, you know, I, I said this last year and I still believe it. Like if you had done your, your strategic plan in 2018, you should probably shelf that for five years and have like an, an interim one to two year until we get back to any sort of normality or more extreme, just rip it up and, and need to begin again each year. And maybe a five year strategy is too long. And, and it has to be, you know, more fluid in terms of what can happen. So I'm going to pass it over to Henry. We, what we've actually done is I have removed the aftercare section and we've put in iPros because that seemed to come up the highest on the survey. So we actually went away and changed our slides around. So we can still share the aftercare slides with you after. Um, but we thought we should touch upon iPros as so many people ask about it. So I'll pass it to you, Henry. I asked Chris if anyone has any questions. He said, I hope not, but um, <laughs> if you, are there any questions first before we move on? Oh, yeah. You're lucky, Chris. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, okay, well, I'm going to use this. I can stand still. still. <laughs> okay, yeah, as Chris said, I mean, we thought we'd maybe ch change the last section because uh, the first poll we did showed the biggest challenge you know, facing you all, you know, was how to identify, you know, package and promote investment project opportunities. Um, and, and we've been doing a lot of work in this area with clients around the world. Chris gave, gave an example of what we were doing previously with um, Ukraine Invest. Um, so I thought I'd share just some, some best practices. Um, and, you know, if you are interested in aftercare as well, you, you might even have a bit more time. We can, we can always go into that also. Okay. Actually, I'm going to sw switch away from that. <laughs> Yeah, you can see the screen better. Okay, so first of all, what is an iPro? So an iPro is an investment project ready to offer. I mean, that, that term actually is not ours. We, we stole it from the International Finance Corporation. <laughs> they, they've been using that recently, but uh, we, we quite like it. Um, um, what is it? It's a package project that's been developed by a private or public entity which is seeking investment. You know, that's a, a simple kind of high-level definition. Now, what does it include? It includes, includes all the information for an investor to gauge first interest, like financial analysis, the sites, or partners, cost, risk, profitability. Um, it can be developed by IPAs, other government entities, or even by private sector organizations as well. Um, it's specific to a country or location's needs. You, it can be used to promote specific investment needs. It can be used to fill financing gaps. You know, that's especially relevant for, for emerging markets. Um, and it's generally focused on long-term projects. Um, Chris gave the example of, you know, which we were impressed by, you know, years ago, Invest Sao Paulo were coming to AIM, the going around all the investors. Um, um, AIM used to be combined with a big real estate event as well, going around them with the iPad, showing all the opportunities. Um, and, you know, it's exactly how it is. I mean, I remember working in, in Jordan with the Jordan Investment Commission um, a few years ago, and they said their challenge is they have golf investors you know, financial investors looking for iPros coming in and saying, look, we have a minimum $100 million a project to spend. What can we invest in? You know, that's the challenge. You know, investors from this part of the world, you know, generally have quite deep pockets and they're looking for quite big projects. So what do you have they can invest in for $100 million? You know, and if you go to a, a Chinese investor, it may be, a, 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 may be similar. Um, so you need, to, you need to identify that portfolio of projects and package them really nicely um, in the right way so that these you know, very sophisticated investors, you know, can, um, can um, you know, invest in them. I'll give another example. The last aim... I came to when it was the last live one, so I guess that's uh, two years ago. Um, um, I, was, I won't say the client, but I was working for a big emerging market, 
um, and they were we were targeting the tourism sector, and they had a booth, you know, at AIM, um, and I was there at the time at the booth, and they had a really nice banner saying all the you know, investment opportunities, you know, the different parts of the country, and then a, a tourism investor came and said, oh, this is really interesting, you know, can I get more information on some of these opportunities? And they gave the investor a guide of incentives. No. That is not what they needed. They, they wanted to have information on the specific investment projects so they could actually see if there's any investment opportunity, and that investor then just walked away. So that's a lost, you know, potentially hundreds of millions of dollars of lost investment, purely because you didn't have your, your investment projects profiled and ready to offer the investors. So this is obviously of extreme importance for IPAs, which is why you all mentioned this is the number one challenge. Uh, it had the highest percentage of people thinking it was the number one ch uh, in the top three challenges. Okay, what are, what are the different types of IPOs? So you know, we've identified in WavTech four, four main types. You know, one you know, is a public sector IPO. That's where you have public, um, mainly public ownership and you're looking for a foreign investor to maybe help finance that project. Um, then you have, secondly, private sector IPOs. That's generally in a, a company. You know, that could be your local company or your startup company, and they're looking for foreign investors, or they're looking for a joint venture partner to, uh, I don't know, expand a manufacturing plant or, or expand a logistics operation or whatever it is, okay? But these are private enterprises in your location looking for foreign investors. Um, then you have privatization, which is self-explanatory. You're privatizing a state asset looking for, for investors. And then fourthly, you have the kind of PPP type investment, your public-private partnerships. So I think when you're thinking of investment projects, you've got to think, this is how investors are thinking. They think, okay, you know, and different investors may be focusing on these diff different segments. You might have some investors which are really focused on investing in other companies. You know, they're in the number two. You may have other investors which are really focused on PPP or others on, on privatization, okay? So I think it's a really useful way to classify it and how to package and your, 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 your IPROs for investors into those four, four main categories. Um, Chris showed earlier the example from Ukraine Invest, and they did it quite nicely where they had you know, the, the, the different categories of, of IPRO available. Um, just looking quickly at, at each of those types, um, a public sector IPRO, um, so yeah, it's public sector, majority public sector owned, they're looking for, for, for financing, um, and um, often it's publicly owned because it may not have enough return on investment for a private company to invest in itself, or it could be a strategic asset you know, which you don't want to hand over to a, you know, a, a private company or, or in particular a foreign investor. They're generally very large and complex projects. Um, generally, they could be large infrastructure projects or public services very commonly like healthcare or education, um, utilities, uh, oil and gas, agriculture. Those, those are where we really see these kind of public sector um, majority owned IPROs. Um, but they also can be very, very interesting for investors, um, especially you know, investors like you know, pension funds, you know, sovereign wealth funds, which aren't maybe looking for really high return on investment, but they're looking for big projects which offer very steady returns over a very long period of time, and they're willing to invest for 20 years you know, in, in, in such a project. Okay, and the question is, you know, IPAs, what's your role? You know, is your role to identify these? Probably not. Is something this, this big like this? Is it to package them together? Maybe a bit of advice on that. But in terms of promoting it to, for, to investors, you know, definitely. You know. um, again, the person from Invest, it was a director of Invest Sao Paulo, I remember him telling me and Chris, he spends most of his time in New York, you know, meeting financial investors to invest in these kind of projects. Okay. Uh, private sector IPROs. Um, so this is, I said, a private company looking for an investor. Um, um, yeah, um, different types. You can see it, for example, in infrastructure as well. It could be I'm setting up an industrial park or a logistics park, um, a convention center. I'm investing in a real estate project, you know, and I need a foreign investor to help finance that project. Um, um, so it's very common in tourism sector in particular where the tourism, those of you who work in tourism will, will know that. Often you have like a hotel manager or a brand like a Hilton or whoever it is. Then you have your, your developer, property developer who's building it. But then you have you know, a financial investor who's coming in to finance it. And there's often those three parties coming together for, for most big tourism projects is, is like that. Um, and then you have industrial companies. There are other companies which are looking for investors to help expand their operation. Generally, it's about expansion. They want a foreign investor to help expand so they can increase the production uh, capacity so they can export to more markets or move into new product areas. 
Um, also, increasingly, it's startups, and we see more and more IPAs, and, and that was result that you could see that in the poll. Um, more and more IPAs are looking to find financial investors for their for their technology startups as well, and that's a that's a really important trend. Just to give one example, there we had a presentation from Invest Turkey, or they called the. Uh, the office reporting to the president of Turkey. I'm not sure exactly, you know, what it's called. But as to your point, they report directly into the president, you know, to, you know, for for, for greater visibility and mandate. Um, they've just set up a financial investment division of the IPA. That financial investment division is purely focused on finding f foreign investors for startups in Turkey. And Turkey's been very successful. They had two unicorns this year. That means two one billion dollar valuations for investors they found. They have one company which is worth more than ten billion dollars now. One startup. Um, so they're re and they have a whole division for this now. They also have a division for PPP as well. So they have their greenfield investment, the usual IPA. They have their financial investment division, and they have their infrastructure and PPP division, which is very interesting. That really reflects how we see IPAs evolving. But we also see IPAs now, um, especially in developed economies, and especially at the regional level, but also at the national level now, setting up talent attraction divisions as part of the IPA. And I'll be doing a panel on Wednesday, I should promote my panel, I can't remember what time, but on Wednesday I'm doing a panel on, on a virtual FDI, where, where we have some really good panelists who will be discussing those kind of issues in, in more detail. Um, so this is really, this is like a, this is kind of B2B, right? This is like a foreign investor looking at a local enterprise for an investment. But as a IPA, you could, because, you, because your job is to work with foreign investors, you're actually in quite a strong position to be able to find foreign investors for local enterprises. But of course you need to know which local enterprises are looking for investors, which ones have the opportunities, make sure their standards up to the right level, make sure it's packaged together nicely, um, make sure investors are aware of the opportunities. Um, okay, maybe. Yeah, privatization, so again, it's probably everyone's familiar with this. You see it in many industries, especially we saw it in you know, Central and Eastern European countries. Most of all, we're seeing it in other, other emerging markets, you know, as, as assets are transferred from state you know, to the private sector and all these kind of typical sectors there. Um, and you know, this is obviously is for, for in particular for, for larger investments generally. Okay, and, and the IPA's role can be very strong to helping to find a, the best quality foreign investors who can you know, compete for those tenders to privatize, to privatize the assets. Okay? Um, I mean, just to give an example, I'm just thinking of ones we're working on now. So we're working, as Chris mentioned, we're working in, in three countries in West Africa. I'm, I'm the country manager for our work in the Gambia, which is a tiny little country in West Africa, a very nice country, good for going on holiday. I was happy to pick that one to go to. Um, but they're building a bridge, okay? But this is not a normal bridge. This is across the, the, the river Gambia, which is, I mean, it's the, the river's like a sea, you know, it's that big. Um, and this bridge is going to be about $800 million investment. And we're going to be helping them go on road shows. And they're looking, for example, they're looking at maybe going to Turkey. They're looking maybe coming to this region as well to find investors in that road project. And that's the IPA doing it. So that, and that will be one of their biggest ever investment projects if, they, if, if they're able to find an investor. But that's what we're going to be helping them do. So it's exactly this, trying to find an investor for an IPRO. Now, in that particular case, they don't have the full project profile yet, but if they find the right investor, they would probably help work with that investor to help them create the feasibility for the project. So they're actually looking for an investor which will actually has enough interest to help create the feasibility uh, project because they, they, they haven't got the, the, the capability to do it themselves. But that's a, a really good example. Um, and, and that, that could be along, along the line of a PPP project, or it could be a, a different format. So PPP obviously is massive all around the world. Um, um, you know, and the, the, the role of the IPA is interesting. Again, we don't generally don't see the IPAs um, um, identifying and packaging the PPP. That's normally done by the relevant government ministry. You know, for that particular industry where the, where the PPP project's in, if it's the Ministry of Energy or Tourism or where, wherever it is. Um, but in terms of finding investors, you know, that's definitely a, a key role we see for IPAs. And I gave the example of West Turkey, which has a whole division for this now. Now, before they established that division, we were working with them in Korea and China. And what we were doing is trying to find investors for their solar tenders. So their solar farm tenders, our job or part of our mandate was to find investors who were interested so they could be invited to the tender process. And that has been incredibly successful. Even they had, a, they had last year a tender for 60 solar farms at the same time. 
You know, that's, how, that's how big it was becoming. Um, because they had a list of all the investors lined up who, who, were, who were ready to bid for these projects. Um, so when you're looking at renewable energy, that's why I said we come back to renewable energy. Uh, renewable energy, the biggest sector for global FDI, the sector we're forecasting the biggest growth in, uh, most of it is around this, right? Your renewable energy investments, the vast majority, or at least on the electricity generation side, around IPROs. You know, having the project defined, having your regulatory environment, having the site ready for the investor to go to, um, and then having the, the, tender, the government tender created, and then trying to find the investors. That's what it's all about. Um, but then you have the whole supply chain around it. You have the manufacturing and the technology, uh, logistics, and that, you know, that's more your traditional type of FDI you can then attract around that. Okay, and often the bigger countries or the bigger tenders they link, you know, so you, you, you can bid for a solar tender in Turkey, but you have to have 25% or 30% or whatever it is, local content. So that then encourages the whole manufacturing supply chain to also invest, and we see that in the bigger tenders. Okay, so these are the four, four main types to, to look at. Um, okay, is that working? Yeah, okay, so yeah, I mean there's different sources of foreign, foreign um, oh, foreign investment or private investment. Um, so you have your foreign and domestic investors. Well, I nearly fell off then. <laughs> um, you have yeah, your pro project developers, private companies, private equity funds who are all looking to invest in projects. And then you have your very long-term investors, the ones I talked about, for example, for you know, a publicly owned project where they're looking for a long return on investment. Your institutional investors, your pension insurance funds, your sovereign wealth funds. I mean, they control trillions, as you know, trillions and trillions of dollars in assets. And they're looking for long-term investment projects to invest in. Okay, so there's a, a lot of money out there. It's about matching that with the opportunities in your location. Okay. Yeah, I mean, just uh, sovereign wealth funds, 2021, $9.15 trillion under management. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a big number. Okay. Um, we already mentioned earlier about project finance, that it's been very resilient during the, during the uh, financial crisis, during the pandemic. So in 2020, it only declined by 5%, and it grew, I think, by 50%, I said, last year. Um, so it shows that not only there's a lot of money, they are actually investing in projects right now. Okay, and why do they matter? You know, th these projects can, if you look at the, the, three, the four types, the type which is focused on private enterprises, that helps grow your domestic companies. We are trying to attract a foreign investor to a manufacturing company or industrial company or a startup. That, that's all about growth, helping them grow. Um, it can really raise the profile of your location. If on your website, your materials, you have your iPros, which investors can invest in, that's helping to raise the brand of your location as a, as a kind of open, open place of business, as a, as a location which wants foreign investment. Um, it's also quite, you know, I mean, I'm not saying it's easy. It's very difficult to identify and package your iPros. And once you've got them, you know, if, if you're you know, an investment, any of you in the room today, if you had your, your iPad and you have all your investment projects all nicely packaged, that's fantastic for going to meet investors. You know, it's, it's, a very, it's, very, it's a very direct sell to the investor. Look, these are the five projects we have you know, in renewable energy in your sector. Here's a profile of each one. You know, we can share these with you. Are you interested? Okay, so it's much more direct because you know, you're selling a specific project to an investor rather than saying, come here because we have skilled labor, we have a strategic location, okay, which is, you know, as Chris said, that can take two to five years, you know, and reaching out to thousands of companies before you find it. This is extremely targeted. I have these projects, I'm going to target these investors which match up with my projects, and we're going to offer those projects to them. It's a very different type of investment promotion, very direct, and you can do it with less resources compared to this reaching out to thousands and thousands of companies and waiting two to five years, Okay. Um, it can also be very strategic, you know, focusing on gaps, you know, in, in your economy. Um, as, we, as I said, it's been more resilient as well. The project financing keeps on coming. Um, the money doesn't disappear. Investors are always out there looking for projects. Um, and it means you can support different types of FDI. This is a big challenge for many IPAs. Is, okay, what do we do about mergers and acquisitions or a local company looking for a joint venture? IPROs is one way you can help deal with them. You find those companies which are looking for foreign investors, package it together, and then you can, f then you can match make between a foreign investor and your local companies. Oops. So how do you do it? Um, first of all, it's sourcing the projects, okay? So that's working with your stakeholders. Um, generally, this is something which is an IPA can't do on its own. 
you need to go to your, you know, your, your, ministry, your ministry of energy you know, and say, okay, what projects do you have in renewable energy which are looking for investors right now or which are upcoming and, you, and, you'd, and we could maybe help build the pipeline of investors to bid for these projects. So you need to speak with your stakeholders or it may be, again, every IPA is different. Some IPAs do trade and investment together. I think Hungry Trade and Investment you know, is, is one example. Um, others are just pure IPAs. They just do investment and they don't do trade. And some, I don't check investors in here, but check investors as an example, maybe they do local enterprise development as well. So IPAs have different mandates. And you, know, you, you may have all the capabilities within your organization, but generally that's not the case. You might have to speak with the local enterprise support organizations, other, other uh, sectoral um, agencies in your country or your region um, to find those local companies which are looking for, for investors. Okay, so it's all about this stakeholder coordination. And then you come up with your list of projects. Um, then you screen them to find those which you know, have the best potential for foreign investment. Um, for the bigger projects, you definitely have to have the more, a bigger feasibility study. Um, but as I said, in, in some cases, you may be able to also find foreign investors who are willing to help co-finance or even help, help, help set up those feasibility studies. Um, and then you know, that's generally done, again, not just by the IPA. You know, if, if we told you, oh, go and do a feasibility study for a, an offshore wind, you know, operation, that's going to be quite challenging for anyone to do. But, you know, you go to your you know, spe sponsors, specialist consultants, development banks, you know, other, other government ministries for all that expertise to package those together. Um, and then you select the ones which are, you know, which are best for promoting. And then you identify the investors, as Chris explained, you know, and go out and, and, and target those investors. Okay. I think that might be the last one. Okay, challenges, oops, um, it requires extensive stakeholder consultation. That's why so many IPAs are struggling to do this, as, as we discovered in the poll, because to, to come up with that list of projects and then screen them and then make sure they're packaged nicely, I mean, it's very challenging to do that. Uh, it's very, very hard and take, can take a lot, a lot of time. Um, and there may just not be those projects yet identified in your, in your location. It may be that you know, other government ministries and stakeholders, they're not really doing, doing it fast enough. So you might have to like, try, try and encourage them or find other ways to do it, to come up with these projects. The case of Jordan I worked in, Jordan Investment, in, with Jordan Investment Commission, in the end, they, they employed like a big four consulting firm. And the big four consulting firm was given a job to find 100 projects in Jordan, profile those projects that are ready to give to all the investors from the Gulf. So they realized that government you know, wasn't doing it, so they actually just outsourced the, the whole work to the private sector because they realized the opportunity is so big to attract these investors. Um, okay. Yeah. So, again, you, 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 can't, you, know, you can't control the project. So if the project is not attractive for an investor, there's not much you can do about that. That's why the screening is very important to, to try to find those which are most attractive and focus on those. Um, there can be issues, as I said, with data, the feasibility studies of those projects. So you might need to find other ways to, to get around that, maybe especially using you know, private sector specialists to, to help, help package those together. Um, and there may be a, a capacity knowledge, a capacity building need. You know, if, if you... If you're given a, a, solar, a solar project to find an investor for, you're giving a local manufacturing company producing a particular product and they're trying to find a foreign investor, that's, there's a lot of understanding of like business accounts, feasibility studies, you know, economic models. I mean, so much expertise is needed, especially on the financial side. You may not have that within your IPA, which is why, say, for example, in the case of Invest Turkey, they set up a specialist division for that with specialists in that area. But you may need to find, you know, either through training, capacity building, um, um, or, or bringing those skills into your IPA. This is going to be very important to promote because you you, you are going to need people with you know with these kind of these, these kind of knowledge so they can they can understand this and speak the same language as the investor. Um, okay. Finally, you know what can you do? Just to summarize it. Um, as I said, you can do the stakeholder consultation, the facilitation to identify those projects. Um, you can engage with the uh, investors so that they understand the opportunities. Um, you can raise awareness of the, of the um, bankability of the project. So you can actually you know, say to your government ministries, hey, wait a minute, you know, this project is not going to be attractive for an, for an investor in our view. And try, you know, to try to you know, bring your knowledge of foreign investment to, to, you know, to actually um, which projects should be developed and promoted. Um, policy advocacy, so for example, I don't know, maybe you, you spoke with investors about PPP projects, but the investor, look, 
you know, the, the regulatory climate is not attractive. Like we were working in one country in the Caribbean recently, last year, and they want to focus on renewable energy, but they, they didn't have feed-in tariffs yet. So without the feed-in tariffs, you know, it wasn't, even though the investors were interested, they said, look, you need to have the regulatory framework in place before we're going to invest. So as an IPA, you have a very strong policy advocacy role to be able to feed that back to the relevant government ministries to make sure you have the right policy environment. Um, you can help identify the projects and then you know, deal, help, help deal with the private investors and target those investors, you know, which as Chris said, you know, the core job of an IPA is, you know, is lead generation, investment generation. Okay, and that's where you can really, really help here. Okay. Fine, I hope that was useful. Any questions on that? Good, okay, so finally, oh, we do? So, sorry, can you say a bit louder? I didn't hear that. <laughs> well, that's, that's good news. Um, okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's, a, um, no, it's, a challenge, it's a challenging area, but I mean, there's so much opportunity. Yeah. Okay, key takeaways. Oh, I thought I had another slide here, but anyway. Um, tre 10 trends impacting economic development and FDI. So I thought I'd just leave you with this just a, as food for thought. Um, I actually did think I had a slide on, on Ukraine, but uh, on the war. It's at the end, okay, so I'll also finish off with that as well, just to look at what the impact might be on FDI. Um, 10 trends impacting economic development and FDI. So we've covered some of this. But I just wanted to kind of pull these together just to leave them with you so you can think about how they might impact your organization. First of all, the global war for talent. You know, we've seen workforce as a, as a key driver of FDI. In many industries, it's by far the number one driver. There's not enough talent in the world. There's not enough skilled, skilled people in many different areas, in particular in ICT-related sectors. And as we've seen, that's already um, exceeded pre-pandemic levels of FDI. And talent... You know, driven by the pandemic as well, is more mobile than ever before. I think there's, since the pandemic, at least 50 countries have launched digital nomad visas, Dubai being one of the first places in the world to do it. So you can move. Before, to move was challenging. Immigra visas, immigration, you know, scoring, all this stuff. Now, it's, if you're a talented technology worker, you can pretty much go anywhere in the world very easily. Okay? So it's a, there's a global war for talent. Remote working modes, um, we looked at uh, a study from McKinsey. McKinsey identified all the sectors which uh, remote working is likely to be the dominant, the dominant um, way of employing people. Then we looked at those sectors with our FDI data to see okay, how much FDI is this impacting. We found that in 2021, nearly 30% of global FDI job creation and FDI could be, could be could they, people could be employed remotely. That has massive, massive impact. You know, you, do you need the office spaces? How do you attract these companies? Um, how, what does it mean for skills in your location? And again, the panel I'm doing on Wednesday will be going in with, 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 with the IPAs on the panel into, the, into this um, subject in particular in a lot more detail. So I'll save that for, uh, for, for Wednesday. But you, ha you have to be looking at that. Um, third main challenge, virtual FDI, which is very closely related. If I can employ my workforce remotely, why do I need to even go to the country? Like, in WAPTEC, we were having the same conversation like Chris and I, saying, what, do we really need to have a subsidiary? You know, in, I won't say which country, in what particular country. Why don't we just have a third-party third party provider and just hire the people through a third party? In fact, why don't we just get a global third-party provider and just don't have any more subsidiaries, just have our one operation, and we can employ people all around the world whenever we need, no matter where they are, through this, through this third-party provider? I mean, that is how companies are thinking now. Okay. And Chris gave, gave the example, I think, earlier of we're working with, with Scotland on, on, on remote working. Or maybe it was another conversation, but we're working with Scotland on their remote working strategy and the impact for FDI. And they gave the example of SpaceX. SpaceX doesn't have an operation in the UK, but they have a big workforce in Scotland. They're all being re employed remotely. So the Scottish Development International, which is one of the world's biggest IP IPAs, said the only way they know now who's a foreign investor in Scotland is to go on LinkedIn. You know, to actually see who's, who, who, who's, you know, what, what uh, job adverts are out there and who people are working for. So they actually go on and type SpaceX and see who's, who's, who's working in Scotland as far as they can. I mean, this, this is already happening, you know, today. It uh, has lots of ramifications. Um, climate change, we've talked about that massive impact on FDI, on renewable energy, on sustainability. I'm sure a lot of the IPAs here today, you're also 
thinking about this, how can we attract FDI, which is going to contribute to the SDGs? You know, how can we measure this? How do we know the ESG you know, performance of a company? How as an organization can we be more sustainable? As Chris said, you know, does that mean we carry on flying around the world or do we have a hybrid? We, we fly only when we need to, to reduce our, CO2, our carbon emissions. So climate change is having a, a big impact, a very, very big impact. Um, number five, Industry 4.0, I already covered that before. Um, in terms of like robotics, AI, cloud computing, how that's changing the nature of manufacturing, the skill requirements is changing. Um, companies are looking at different location determinants now. Oh, is this working? Yeah, nearshoring supply chain optimization. So um, World Bank survey recently showed over 60% of multinationals consider supplier linkages to be important or critically important to their loca location decisions. Now, first of all, we had the China-US trade war and, and, and tensions. That created a whole shift of investment out of China. Um, secondly, we had COVID, which further shifted more investment you know, out of China and, and made companies reevaluate their supply chains. Um, now we have the, the war in Ukraine, which is also having a further impact on supply chains in different industries again. So we have had three shocks within two years, all impacting supply chains. So you know, this is becoming more and more important for investors. Uh, and governments, but you know, investors are really, really evaluating right now how, how do they regionalize and localize their supply chains. So they don't have dependency in any one country for anything. <laughs> okay, that's a bit, a bit close to that camera. Um, okay. Outsourcing. So outsourcing is related to reshoring. So like, if I'm a company, um, I, I give Turkey, I live in Turkey is a good example. In Turkey, they have an opportunity to attract reshoring investment because they have a customs union with the EU, yes? The same as you know, Central and Eastern European countries, the same as North Africa. They, they're, they're all the kind of lower cost, high quality locations which can access the EU market very easily um, or, or already a, a part of the EU market. But so companies can, can relocate their supply chains there. Or, which increasingly they're doing, they can just outsource to a local company which is not FDI, it's contracting, but the impact is the same in terms of jobs and exports and everything else. So outsourcing is definitely becoming way more important because it can be much more feasible for a company to outsource rather than set up operations itself around the world. Okay, so companies always, always will have this like, trade uh, d decision, do I outsource or do I set up on my own? Okay, and in certain industries like textiles as an example, maybe way more driven by outsourcing compared to FDI. So as a, as a location which can benefit from reshoring or, 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 out, or offshoring, it may be more an outsourcing opportunity rather than an FDI opportunity. It depends on each location. Um, digitalization, so uh, Chris talked about that in detail, how, how it's impacting the techniques you use to attract investment and, and, and according to Chris's view that that's gonna be here to stay, even if we go back to tra traditional face-to-face investment promotion activities, the digital side is still gonna be massively more important than it was before the pandemic. But that's affecting everything, you know, um, affecting the industries you're targeting, affecting how you facilitate investment. You know, we, we all know the example probably of Enterprise Estonia, where you can just go onto a website, and you can just set up your company, you can get your work permit, and you can live there without actually having to visit the country. You know, so that's an extreme case, but other countries are doing that as well. Um, using digital technologies to help facilitate investment. And also now, not just about investment and business, but also about talent. Making it very easy for talent to move to your location. Okay, I think almost there, I think. Nine, non-traditional FDI. So we talked about iPros. But that was a, that's why we kind of brought it in, non-traditional FDI. Um, but also like mergers and acquisitions, other types of investment. Um, more and more IPAs are looking at those, uh, at those areas as really important. And I know startups as well. You know, um, Chile was the first um, IPA in the world to target foreign entrepreneurs to set up startups in Chile. They had, I think, nearly 1,500 foreign startups established, but it's not actually FDI. You're not attracting a foreign investor, there's no foreign investment capital. Actually, they give the capital. <laughs> the Chilean government pays you to do it. Uh, 50,000, or maybe it's $100,000 now, I'm not too sure exactly, but you're attracting foreign entrepreneurs to set up businesses. So this idea of like uh, IPA's job is to attract FDI, I mean, that seems to be becoming a very outdated model. No, your job is to um, attract investment and economic development and spur economic development. Um, and there's many different ways to do that now, not just through traditional Greenfield FDI, as we've seen. Um, lots of other countries copy, Ch or quite a few other countries copy Chile and has similar startup programs um, now to attract entrepreneurial startups. And this whole area, 
<laughs> we were just explained by the C Chris and I at lunch with the CEO of Dubai FDI, uh, Mr. Fahad, now this is going to be a hub for startups. Now this whole area is going to be transformed to make it easy for digital nomads to move here, people to set up, I think they said there was, I don't know how many startups they said, 300. 300 startups already planning to move to this to expo afterwards. Okay? So it show, shows, the, shows the potential. Finally, the pandemic recovery. As we, as we recover from the pandemic or it moves to endemic, uh, depending on country by country, um, that's going to lead to growth of renewable energy, healthcare, life sciences investments, food security, supply chain relocations. Um, hopefully, the economies will start growing fast. Well, they, are, they have been growing faster again until the, the, the most, recent, most recent crisis, which will all spur further, further FDI. Um, and eventually, you know, I think we're already going to see it in aerospace, but tourism and aerospace industries will recover, and there's going to be a, a lot of pent-up investment needs, huge investment needs in those, those two industries, which will then spur a really strong growth in FDI, we expect. So those are t ten, t 10 trends to watch. Finally, uncertain future, because the whole this workshop is about uncertain future, the war in Ukraine. Um, so we're going to stay out of the political side of that, just focus on the, 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 the FDI side. Um, so on the FDI side, we've kind of tried to identify, you know, some of the impacts, whether that's going to be lead to an, an increase in FDI or decrease in it, uh, uh, dec uh, decrease in FDI. So first of all, we talked about inflation already. You know, what impacts inflation going to have? Oil and gas prices are really high again. Um, inflation is rising. Cost of manufacturing has gone up. You know, it's more expensive to invest. FDI is likely to decline as a result. So that's negative on FDI. On the other hand. Um, there's going to be more investment in FDI in coal and natural gas outside of, outside of Russia and Ukraine. That's happening already. So, I mean, it's not, it's not what we're forecasting. It's already happening. Um, and if, you, if you're a country, and we, we, we're working in such countries where maybe we're working in one country where BP was planning a, 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 a big oil project. They canceled it because of COP26. They're moving to renewables. Now we're saying, look, you probably should go back to BP because now there's a need for more investment again. Now, People argue is it's good or bad for climate change. That's another an, another subject. But there's a you know, we can't survive as a world right now without oil and gas. So you know we still we still need it, and that is going to lead to new investment opportunities in other countries as as they diversify around uh, away from Russia. That also is going to affect certain minerals as well. There's a a massive global shortage, like nickel, other industry, other minerals, which are metals which are used for for uh, batteries in particular for electric vehicles. Um, investors are scouring the world looking at in, in uh, where where can they get get these supplies. And this is not something which is just short term. This is long term. Companies do not want to be dependent on any one country. Okay, that is the new absolute reality which we face. Okay, so companies are going to diversify. Their, there's going to be more investment projects than before in these industries, and that's, uh, I think that's a fact. That's gonna happen. Th they have to diversify. You know, even if everything gets sorted out in, in Europe and everyone you know, gets back to normal at some point, still there's gonna be a need to diversify production and supply. Um, we know agricultural food security is having massive impact right now um, you know, because, because Ukraine is such an enormous food producer and also Russia. Um, now it takes time, obviously, to, you know, to ramp up food. I mean, um, you know, I, I, I really don't know what the impact's likely to be longer term, but in the short term, you know, there's, there's growing investment in other places. But longer term, hopefully, it will all go back and Ukraine will be you know, a, a big global, global producer again and helping to feed the world. Um, um, yeah, so... Sanctions, the war is reducing company profitability. You know, BP have just, uh, they, uh, they um, wrote off, I think, 10 billion, at least $10 billion of investment in, in Russia, Exxon, and the other companies, they wouldn't the same. Tens of billions of dollars being lost just in one industry. So this is impacting the bottom line, which will, in certain industries, reduce, reduce FDI, and it will lower world economic growth. The lower the world economic growth is, the less FDI there is. So this is having a real negative, negative impact. Um, some countries, like where I live in Turkey, com we completely, I live in Antalya, which is the main beach resort, um, completely dependent on Russian Ukrainian tourism. Completely. So that's, you know, they're going to have a big, a big crisis. And other countries, not just Turkey, like Thailand, for example, Thailand, very dependent on Russian tourism. Russia is a huge source of global tourists to certain countries. So that's going to then impact, you know, impact, you know, those industries and reduce investment. Um, Defense spending, unfortunately, uh, that's the reality, I guess, that you know, m military spending is going up you know, um, in Europe in particular, which will then likely, because Europe has generally been much weaker in defense, whereas the US is super strong, probably there'll be a lot of US investment you know, flowing into Europe in the t into the defense sector, um, in particular where 
haven't seen it yet, but likely to, likely to see that to take place. Um, and then finally, and this is where I think, yes, short term, we're going to have more investment in coal, oil, and natural gas and minerals, which will increase carbon emissions. That is, that's just a, a necessity. Um, but at the same time, I think countries realize they need to accelerate even, first, even faster into renewables. Okay? And there's hu huge, even bigger pu push than, than after COP26 to do that. So we expect there to be even more investment taking place in renewable energy, which is positive you know, for, for the climate, for economies, and for the world. So that's our, our final thoughts. Um, I think we are wrapping up anyway. I think that's the end. So thank you very much. Um, and any final questions or comments? Or oh, Chris, I don't know if you want to say a few words. Good. OK, well, thanks, everyone, for attending. And I uh, look forward to networking with you at AIM. Thanks. Bye.